So today is the first video in a very special new series about physical culture history in which we're going to do something that I don't think, at least to my knowledge, has ever been done before, at least in recent times. And that is getting back in shape exclusively using 19th century and early 20th century historical physical fitness methods, which I'm hoping will be really informative and educational because I think for much of, uh, much of the modern era, these historical methods of the past have really been portrayed as being somewhat silly. No fish! Here in the Battle Creek Sanitarium, the spirit soar, the mind is educated, bowels, bowels are born again. I think this goes back uh, somewhat in part to the silent era when you had people like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton lampooning these methods as they were lampooning, mocking everything of their time period. And that stuff has sort of molded our modern notions about what it is. But the question is, were these methods really silly and ridiculous or were they actually uh, effective and sophisticated and something that's valuable that we can learn from? Now, granted, at the time, there was some strange stuff, you know, some bizarre things did exist. There were strange exercises and machines and things like that. Uh, but honestly, not more so than today. I mean, I think a hundred years from now, people are gonna look back on our time and are absolutely going to mock and ridicule and laugh at a lot of the fads and the things that are popular now, no doubt about it. Regarding the fitness methods of the past, I think if you look at the actual film footage of what they were doing at the time instead of the fiction, there's a lot of really impressive stuff and there was a lot of actual sophisticated material uh, that was being done at the time. The real question for us today and what we're gonna be exploring in this video is how effective was it compared to what people are doing today? Uh, is there something there that we can learn from or, or not? Before I proceed, a little bit of a background story as to how I arrived at this personally. So before this year, I was in much better shape than I am in now. I used to go to the gym almost every day, I used to run almost every day, I used to do martial arts several times a week. But then I moved out uh, here to LA about two years ago, my work became more sedentary, and then a year ago, of course, the pandemic hit and there was a shutdown. Gyms shut down, the parks shut down, um, so I uh, didn't have as much access to that. And then about six months ago, my wife and I had our first child, which has been an absolute joy, absolutely wonderful. Um, but of course, as any new parent can tell you, the first uh, several months, you really don't have as much time, as much free time to do some of the things you want to do and to stay in shape. So um, I've only really been able to run maybe once a week tops. Uh, my martial arts fencing, classical fencing, maybe once a week. Uh, I do some fancy club swinging as well, but it just hasn't been enough and I just haven't had enough time. So all these things have kind of conspired to probably put me in the worst shape that I've been in the last 20 years. But then I thought to myself, maybe this represents an interesting and unique opportunity. I've done all this historical research on the physical fitness methods of the past. Uh, so my body's sort of broken down. My posture is slipping a little bit. I've gained a, a bit of weight, not not most of it, not muscular, but now to rebuild it and get back in shape, maybe I could do that using exclusively these historical methods and basically put to the side and throw out a lot of the other stuff that I've been doing for all these years and use only these historical methods to get back into shape and use myself as an experiment, basically as a guinea pig, to see what that would do to a person's body. And maybe, 15, 20, 25 years from now, it'll be something fun for my son to look back on uh, to see something that I was doing at this time. I think it's also an opportunity to show how the mindset and the whole philosophy and approach to physical culture at that time is a lot different than uh, the modern uh, pop gym approach today. Years ago when I used to go to the gym all the time and I was doing what everyone else is doing there and learning from my friends, Pretty much it was all about is building as much strength as possible. It's about getting big and getting tough. I mean, yeah, there might have been a little bit of cardio and flexibility, but it was really about building strength. I mean, we looked up to guys like Schwarzenegger and Stallone, I think, as a lot of the, the people in the previous generations looked up to Charles Atlas. But I don't think 
there was any functional objective to the type of strength that we were trying to cultivate. It was just basically, you know, curls and bench press and all that stuff. Back in the 1800s, by contrast, you know, this type of stuff did exist, but it was a much more limited type of specialized activity. I mean, you had wrestlers who were trying to bulk up, you had strong men who performed at circuses and fairs and became little mini celebrities. Uh, in fact, my, my own great-great-grandfather, David Miller I, was a local strong man, and around the turn of the century, he was known as the strongest man in San Jose, California, and he used to pull a fully loaded wagon with just a leather strap in between his teeth. So you had, you know, local sort of uh, notorious individuals who were, who were doing things like that, performing feats of strength, but they were the exception to the rule, really. It wasn't really something that the average gym-going male aspired to do, you know. They just weren't trying to bulk up. They had other objectives in mind. So, in the 19th century, what were they looking to do? Well, they had a lot of different objectives in mind. Now, in order to give an idea of how they looked at fitness differently in the 19th century, I'm going to read a passage from Watson's Calisthenics, which is published in 1864 during the American Civil War. And he says, In order that calisthenics may produce the most desirable effects on the mental and spiritual nature of man, as well as on his physical, it is not only necessary that the movements have a determined form and order of execution, but that they have a determined time, the rhythms or divisions of which is well established in the mind. Just think about that for a second. The mental and spiritual aspects of fitness are being given equal importance to the physical aspects. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that you know most people, when they go to the gym today, they're not thinking about the spiritual aspects of when they're doing the bench press or a dumbbell curl. So it's a more holistic and comprehensive approach to fitness and musculature, I think. So what I've done in order to devise a regimen for myself as I've gone through all these different sources and texts from the period, from the early 1800s all the way to the early 1900s, and rather than focus on just one particular method or author or text, I've plucked from a lot of different places, uh, and this is for a couple different reasons. First of all, I was mainly selecting the exercises that I thought would be interesting to me personally and that I could do because, believe it or not, there's actually some pretty wild and difficult stuff if you look through some of these texts. I also wanted to give uh, an interesting spread and variety of the type of things that you would see. And not only that, but the different types of exercise apparatus that they used. For a long time now, I've been collecting antiques related to physical culture and so we have a lot of antique tools as you can see behind me and I'll actually be using some of the exact same tools down to the weight and everything that they're advocating in these texts and these methods we'll be able to use the exact ones and in a minute I'm gonna do a little show and tell with those things but first I just wanted to make a, a little disclaimer before I proceed that this series is not intended to be instructional it's not pedagogical. Uh, I'm not intending for you to try to copy me and follow along as I do this, and there's a couple really good reasons for that. First of all, the instructions in these texts are often extremely precise. I mean, right down to the positioning of the feet, the exact alignment of the joints. And if you're to do that wrong, you could get injured. And if I was to really make this instructional, I would have to show it from every different angle and be very precise, and the video would be 10 times longer, and even then, it wouldn't be a replacement for a professional instructor. And just to give a couple anecdotes of how that is dangerous and how that can go wrong, I was recently uh, witness to a class, a live online class that someone gave on Indian club swinging, and they started doing advanced movements and then said, you know, told the people who were watching to just follow along. And immediately uh, several people commented that they had struck themselves in the head uh, with the Indian clubs. So you really should do this under the guidance of an instructor. But I will actually be noting in some of these videos, I'll be linking to uh, some veteran instructors and in some cases masters that you can learn from. So I won't leave, you, uh, won't, won't leave you totally hanging. Reason number two why you just don't want to follow along to what I'm doing is that, as I said earlier, this is an experiment, one that I'm performing on myself. Uh, these methods are mostly untested and I don't even know if I'm going to recommend them to you once I'm done with them. I may find that I don't like some of them or that they're, you know, it feels weird. Uh, I have a lot of experience. I've done physical therapy and I've had injuries over the years and I feel like I have a pretty good intuition 
of when not to push something. Maybe if I feel a little pain here and I could push through the pain, but I know that in two weeks from that time, it's gonna to lead to an injury. So I have this sensitivity, but I'm thinking that a lot of the people at home who are following this probably don't have that sensitivity. And for that reason, I'm gonna tell you, do not follow along. And the third reason why you shouldn't follow along is that the apparatus, the tool does matter. And as I was saying earlier, I have all the, the antique apparatus that was being used at the time. And it was very specific what you were supposed to use. I can tell you right now that if you are gonna take some of these light dumbbell exercises that I'm showing and you're gonna try to try that with a modern, heavier dumbbell, you can definitely injure yourself. If you're gonna try some of the light club swinging or some, any of the club swinging techniques with a club that's the wrong weight or that's a modern mass produced club that's not balanced correctly, you could injure yourself. So for all these reasons, I'm done with my disclaimer now, but for all these reasons, uh, you should not just try to follow along. But that said, we're, there's gonna be a lot of interesting exploration of the history, of the context, and we are gonna talk about the techniques. I'm gonna talk about um, the basics and how it's affect, how I feel that it's affecting me, what I feel that it's doing. So I think there is gonna be a lot to, to learn and to absorb. So as I said earlier, I'm gonna be pulling a lot of different techniques and methods, although we are gonna be focusing on a couple in particular or, that I'm drawing from heavily, and that is uh, Swedish calisthenics or Swedish free gymnastics, which was hugely influential and sort of a foundation for a lot of what came after. Uh, also Watson's calisthenics, which I read from earlier, which is from the American Civil War. And also from the work of Mr. Tom Burroughs, who was, he was known mainly as a club swinger, but he was an all-around athlete. He was a boxer, a fencer, a wrestler, and he's got some really interesting uh, exercises uh, in his physical culture series. In terms of the progression in week one, we're gonna start with some posture and breathing exercises because a posture and breath was a, was a really important thing at this time. Then we're gonna move on to Swedish calisthenics or free gymnastics. After that, we will get to dumbbell day. As you can see right here, we have a one pound spalding dumbbell and it's unmarked wood dumbbell that's about three and a half pounds. Um, these were, as you can see, they're made of wood and they were much lighter for the most part uh, compared to the dumbbells that are in use today. A lot of people see these and they think, well, how silly, how could you ever benefit from doing a, a dumbbell curl or a, or a press with these? And in fact, you wouldn't. Um, the exercises are much different, much, much faster than what you tend to see today. You're going to find, I think, on, when we get to dumbbell day, that it's going to look much different than anything you, you see today. Another uh, historical tool that we're going to show is the wand or gymnastic wand. This is made by Spalding in probably the late, late 19th or early 20th century. It's made of hardwood. Uh, it was also known as the barbell. It's basically the ancestor of what we know as today's barbell. But this was a, a tool used for flexibility and a variety of gymnastic exercises that really don't resemble anything uh, that is used with a modern, heavy uh, barbell today. It's also a lot less known than, you know, something like uh, Indian clubs or kettlebells, obviously. Most people don't even remember what this was. Which brings us to our next tool. This is an iron wand, so similar in form to the wood one I just showed, but solid iron and a little bit shorter. And this is actually called, uh, known sometimes as a French dumbbell, or just a barbell but of course used very differently than any dumbbell or barbell is used today. And there is some overlap in technique with the wooden wand, but not a lot. There were a lot of exercises that with the wood that you would not want to do with this, and there were some exercises that will be shown that are very specific to the heavy iron wand. And next we'll finally get to Indian clubs, as you can see here, and actually there's quite a few uh, on the wall behind me. Indian clubs, obviously, were one of the most popular exercise tools of the time. And we have some here that are exactly like the ones that are used in the texts. So it'll be very accurate. They're probably the best known implements uh, that we'll be using because there's been a sort of a resurgence in recent years of Indian club swinging. Although, um, as you're going to find out, it never died out completely. There were uh, always uh, practitioners alive and some of those people are still passing down techniques today. The exercises that we're gonna be focusing on in the video, 
Uh, rather than show Indian Club swinging and compete with that, because there's a lot of videos out right now on YouTube about Indian Club swinging, which swinging meaning in continuous motion. So we're gonna be focusing on the exercises, which were intended for physical development. These are more transitions between static postures, and in some cases, holding static postures. And a lot of those will come from some of the most obscure works of Tom Burroughs. So in terms of how this regimen is gonna proceed, in week one, every day is going to be one of these different categories, and which I'll start off by giving a little brief history of it, showing you the implements going through the exercises. Then in week two, I'm gonna mix it up a little bit so that rather than go according to the apparatus, we'll have you know, leg day, back day, arm day, things like that. It'll be designed more for my benefit. And as I go through these exercises and after I go through them, I'm going to give you, the viewer, an assessment of what I think it's doing to me, how I feel, and what I think it's working exactly. Uh, and also give an assessment the next day in terms of where I'm sore and you know, how I, how, what I felt like it's done to me. In the final week, I'll film the exercises again, showing uh, how exactly I have improved and also what the result has been. In the end, I'm not under any expectations that this is going to turn me into a Hercules, nor is that really my desire or objective. Uh, as a fencer, I found that uh, building up a lot of bulk sort of slows me down, gets in the way. I don't really want that, um, but I'm hoping it will develop my health and uh, physique in a, in a more holistic and beneficial way. In conclusion, I hope you found this video informative and that you enjoy the series that is to come. If you like what you see here, please feel free to like and subscribe below. Thanks and have a great day.